Take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 7. If you don't have your Bible with you, uh, you'll find this in the Pew Bible on page 916. Acts chapter 7, we're coming to the section in the book of Acts which describes the martyrdom of Stephen. We've been studying the life of Stephen for the past few Sundays. He's faithfully preached Christ in Jerusalem. The Jews have lied about him, debated him. He's been dragged before the Sanhedrin. Last Sunday, we read his long speech where he defends himself against their accusations. But at the end of that speech, Stephen had accused the Jews of resisting the Holy Spirit as they had been doing for hundreds of years. And as Stephen gives that stinging accusation, they are done listening. They plug their ears, they grind their teeth, they rush in on him, and they stone him to death. And in our passage today, we're going to be seeing how Stephen's death was fruitful for the kingdom of God. To the world standards, Stephen would look like a total failure. But by God's power, Stephen's martyrdom advances the missionary purposes of God. So turn to Acts chapter 7, and we'll read verse 54, and we'll read to chapter 8 on down into verse 8. And if you're able, let's stand as we read God's Word. So Stephen has just accused the Jews of resisting the Holy Spirit, and it says, in verse 54, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. This is God's word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but God's word endures forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are amazed as we have studied the life of Stephen and we see the details of his martyrdom. Lord, what a faithful servant of Christ. And Lord, we pray that as we study uh, the martyrdom of Stephen, that you would give us eyes to see the lessons that you have for us, that we might be bold for Jesus, and that we might learn the lesson that you advance your kingdom through suffering and death. Lord, help us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow Christ wherever he leads us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please be seated? In the fourth century, a monk named Telemachus entered the Roman Colosseum to protest the gladiatorial games. 
The gladiatorial games were brutal, barbaric, and inhumane. Grown men would combat with one another and fighting to the death for sport and spectacle. And as you might imagine, Christians were staunchly opposed to the games. And Telemachus had gone into the stadium and stood in between two men who were about to fight with swords drawn. He raised his hands and he said, In Christ's name, stop! A hush fell over the stadium as this monk was intruding on their fun. No one knew what to say or what to do. And they stood looking in puzzled amazement. But then once again, to show that he was serious, Telemachus lifted his hands and he said, In Christ's name, stop! Another hush, and then a rustle, and then a stone hissing through the air, striking him in the chest followed by another, and then another, and then another, and soon Telemachus was buried beneath a barrage of stones, and their games continued. To outward appearances, it would look like Telemachus' sacrifice on that day was a total failure. But those who studied history know better. Years later, the Christian emperor Honorius outlawed the gladiatorial games in the Roman Empire forever. And when he did so, he cited the courageous sacrifice of a monk named Telemachus. When I think about Telemachus's martyrdom, I think about the words of Jesus in John 12, 24, where Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now those words certainly apply to the death of our Lord through the death of Jesus on the cross. His death bears much fruit. It saves all of His elect throughout space and time. Jesus was lifted up on the cross and He saves all believers by His perfect sacrifice on Calvary's tree. But those words of Jesus also apply to all of those who would give up their lives for the sake of the gospel. That a life given up in death for Jesus is like a grain of wheat that falls into the ground, and then it, if it dies, it bears fruit. Those words certainly apply to Stephen. Stephen was like a grain of wheat that was cast into the earth and died, but in his death, it bore fruit for the kingdom. And today, as we look at this passage, we're going to see how Stephen's faithful martyrdom produced a fruitful death that shows us that Christ advances His kingdom through suffering and death. We would like to have it another way. We would like for Christ to advance His kingdom through our prosperity and through our ease, through our success in the eyes of the world, through the applause of man. But the way Christ normally advances His kingdom is through great costs coming to the lives of His committed followers. Stephen lost his life. A great persecution came on the church, but then the believers were scattered. And as they were scattered, so was the gospel. And the gospel was taken from Jerusalem, throughout Judea, throughout Samaria, and then eventually it would go throughout the whole Roman Empire within that generation. Christ advances His kingdom through suffering and death. If you want to be a faithful witness for Jesus, you may not be a martyr, but it will cost you something. You will have to die to your own reputation. You will have to die to your own comfort. You'll have to die to your own safety. You'll have to die to what you want to do in order to love others and proclaim the words of life to them. But when you do, you see how fruitful it is whenever you give up your life for Jesus. Anything you give away to Jesus is never wasted but it's always used by him for the advance of his kingdom. Now in our passage today, I want us to ask this question. What fruit could possibly come from Stephen's martyrdom? Well, notice three things. First of all, you see that Stephen's death reveals the glory of Christ. So in our passage, Stephen has finished his defense before the Sanhedrin. He's given that long history of Israel. 
He's, he's told them about how their fathers resisted the Holy Spirit. And then he came in for the punch. And he said, you are resisting your Holy Spirit as your fathers did. They become angry. They're enraged. They gnash their teeth. It's interesting. Jesus describes those who are in hell as those who gnash their teeth. And these Jews are filled with a hellish fury. They plug their ears and they rush in on him and they're seizing him and they're ready to drag him out of the city. The Jews were not allowed to execute citizens by stoning. They were under Roman rule at this time. So this is not a legal execution. But this is an act of mob violence. They seize Stephen and they are taking him out. But as you notice, as they are taking him out of the city and ready to kill him, he looks up into heaven. And being full of the Holy Spirit, he sees the glory of God. And he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And as, as Stephen is gazing into heaven, he, he can't help but speak. And he says to these Jews, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now remember, these are Jews who belong to the Sanhedrin. These are Jews who had brought Jesus of Nazareth before their kangaroo court. These are Jews who had said to Jesus of Nazareth, tell us plainly, are you the Christ? Are you the Son of the Most Blessed? And remember what Jesus said? I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the glory, coming with the clouds of heaven. And remember, the high priest had torn his garments and he said, blasphemy, what else do we need to hear? He must be crucified. And now Stephen, before the same men, is saying, I see it. I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He sees the glory of Christ's person. He's standing enveloped by the glory of God. The glory of God refers to all the radiance of God's magnificence, the sum total of His attributes glowing, as it were, in heavenly glory. And Christ is right there in the glory of God as God's co-equal at the right hand of God. He sees the glory of His position. He's at the right hand of God, a position of power, a position of honor a position of prestige, a position of the highest rank in heaven and earth. He sees the glory also of his posture. He's standing, isn't he? Throughout the Bible, when you look at Christ, we're told that he ascended into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. And so normally, Christ is described as sitting down at God's right hand. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, he makes a big deal about Christ sitting at the right hand of God. He says, Christ has offered the final sacrifice for sins, and now he's seated. He's finished his work. But this is the only place in all the Bible where we're told that Christ is standing at God's right hand. And it's as if Christ is standing to welcome Stephen, his faithful witness, into heaven. And Christ is standing, almost as if to give Stephen a standing ovation. You know, when you go to the symphony and there's a beautiful performance, sometimes the audience will stand and applaud that performance as if to recognize its greatness. And Christ is standing, honoring Stephen, also standing to get a better view of his suffering child there about to be stoned. Christ is in heaven, glorified, but He cares about the suffering saints on the earth. You know how when we're at a baseball game and there's a hit and it goes deep into the outfield, what does the stadium do? They stand to their feet so that they might see, is it going to go over the fence? And so Christ is standing in His glory and Stephen's eyes are open and he sees this. But notice, he sees it, he speaks of it. But the Sanhedrin can't see. They're angry, they plug their ears, they rush in on him, and they drag him out of the city, and they stone. wonder if going through their mind. We remember how that messianic pretender said we would see the Son of Man coming with clouds of heaven. Here he is his follower saying he would come with the clouds of heaven. These men are crazy, and they just want to snuff it out. We are not able to see 
with our physical eyes what Stephen saw. We walk by faith, not by sight. But we are invited to look through Stephen's eyes and see the glory of Christ. The glory of the one who died on the cross for our sins, who rose again and who ascended into heaven, and who is no longer wearing a crown of thorns, but he's wearing a crown of glory. He is exalted above all people, all places, all times. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, the heavenly angel, seraphim, cherubim, flank him, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of glory. And he is Jesus. And, and Stephen sees this one who was seen in a vision by Daniel. In Daniel 7, 13, where he saw this one like a son of man who appeared before the ancient of days and an international kingdom was given to him. And Stephen is able to see this and we are able to look through his eyes and see it too. Why? Because the only thing that will motivate you to suffer and die for the sake of the kingdom is the glory of Christ. If you're living like most Americans for your own personal happiness and fulfillment and enjoyment, you won't suffer much for the kingdom. You won't deny yourself. I mean, think about in our culture, everything in our culture is opposite of what Jesus said. Jesus said, come after me, deny yourself. Our culture says, fulfill yourself. Make yourself happy. Jesus says, take up your cross. Our culture says, get a big home, get a nice car, make a lot of money. It's all diametrically opposed to the cost of discipleship that Jesus sets before us. But what makes us willing to deny ourselves? The glory of Christ, the one who suffered for us, the one who is exalted to the right hand of the Father, the one who stands with his martyrs who suffer. That one is worthy of us giving away everything for the sake of the kingdom, worthy of losing everything. And Stephen understood that. And he saw the glory of Christ, and that is fruit that is produced by this faithful death. But notice not only that Stephen's death reveals the glory of Christ, notice also that Stephen's death reveals the love of Christ. So as they are dragging him out of the city and they are ready to stone him, they take their garments off because of the bloodshed that is about to happen, and they lay their garments at the feet of a man named Saul. We know Saul of Tarsus will later be converted by the grace of God. And here is his first appearance as the persecutor of the church and as the one who hated Christians. He's presiding over the execution of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. And so they lay these garments aside because of the bloodbath that is about to ha happen. And as they're stoning Stephen, Stephen looks up into heaven and he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Jesus is there standing at the right hand of God and Stephen is, wants to pass through the gates of splendor and fall into the arms of his omnipotent Savior. Remember, Jesus from the cross said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But Stephen puts Jesus in the place of the Father, showing the divinity of Christ, and he says, into your hands, Lord Jesus, I commit my spirit because he's going to pass into heaven. Now, Stephen is not going into the immediate presence of God because of his martyr, his martyrdom. It's not like his martyrdom has merited salvation. Stephen is a sinner like we are, saved by the grace of God. Stephen only is able to go into the presence of Jesus because Jesus died on the cross for his sins, and he's received that free gift, and now he's giving up his life and martyrdom as an expression of gratitude to his Lord in order to further the missionary purposes of God. But as he dies, notice how he falls to his knees and he cries out, and these are his last words, and how profound are his words. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. In the last moment of his life, not a shred of bitterness, not one sense of retaliation or tit for tat, I need to repay these Jews for stoning me. Remember, these Jews have lied about him. They've borne false testimony against him. They've dragged him out to murder him. This is an illegal execution. They've stoned him, and the last thing on his mind is, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. 
If you thought that G, uh, Stephen was unkind or unloving because of how harsh he was in his preaching, you would be wrong. Stephen loved those Jews he addressed earlier on in this chapter. Those Jews who were stiff-necked. Those Jews who were resisting the Holy Spirit. Those Jews who didn't want the Holy and Righteous One. Stephen loved them. And he wanted them to know Christ. And he wanted them to be forgiven. He was driven by love to his faithful sacrificial ministry. He didn't see them as a project. He didn't see them as just another hitch on his belt of conversions. He loved these Jews, and he did not want their crimes to be held against them. He's imitating Christ here again. Not only in, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit, but also when he says, do not hold this sin against them. We remember that when Jesus died, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So even from the cross, Jesus prayed for the forgiveness of his assailants. Jesus practiced what he preached. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Bless those who curse you. If you love those who love you, what good is that? Everybody does that. Even tax collectors and sinners do that. But love those who hate you. Do not repay evil for evil. And you better believe that this image of Stephen loving his assailants as Christ loved his assailants stayed in the minds of those who killed him. It must have been in the mind of Saul of Tarsus. It must have been in the mind of these Jews that here is something completely different. You might have even expected Stephen to pray some imprecatory psalms, calling curses down on the wicked, but Stephen doesn't do that. He prays for the forgiveness of those who are murdering him. Francis Schaeffer once said that love is the final apologetic. Francis Schaeffer was probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Christian apologist in the 20th century. Great mind, wonderful ability to articulate the faith and defend it against skepticism. Came against the secular humanism that he saw prophetically coming into our country and producing all of the nonsense we see in our culture today. Those who've read his books like Christian Manifesto and others, the great evangelical disaster, know how keen his mind was and how prophetic his insight. But Francis Schaeffer said, the greatest apologetic, the greatest defense is love. Love for the lost. And so Stephen loved them. I think of Corey Ten Boone in her book, The Hiding Place. You know that she and her family were imprisoned in the Nazi concentration camp for hiding Jews. And all of her family was killed in the concentration camp. And later on, she went through churches throughout Germany, proclaiming the love of God and speaking about forgiveness. And in one church in Munich, she was speaking, and afterwards, an SS soldier came to her. And she recognized the soldier from the concentration camp. She had just been speaking about forgiveness, and her heart was filled with hatred and rage against this soldier because she remembered him watching as her sister was beaten by the Nazis. And she was so angry. And all of a sudden, she was in a, in a, in a moment, a crisis of faith. I know I'm supposed to forgive him, but it's so hard. And he stuck out his hand to her to shake her hand. And he said, that message of Jesus is really something, Fräulein. He, his blood wipes away all of our sins. And she prayed in that moment, Lord Jesus, I can't forgive, I can't forgive. And something in her caused her hand just to go up and shake him. And she said she felt grace and love just travel like energy through her arm, down her fingertips, and into his hand. And she had a love for him and a forgiveness that she knew came from Christ. Christ can give us the power to love those in our sinful flesh we would hate. And in Stephen's sinful flesh, he would have every reason to hate these Jews. But what happens? In that final moment, he displays 
the love of Jesus. If we want to win people to Christ, even those who are openly hostile, those who hate our faith, who hate our Bible, we must love. We must have hearts swelling with compassion for the lost. Remember Jesus? He looked out on the crowds and he saw them harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The love of Christ for people. He looks with eyes of love and so does Stephen following his Savior. So we see how Stephen's death reveals the glory of Christ, how it reveals the love of Christ. But notice in the third place also how Stephen's death here reveals the mission of Christ. So Stephen dies. He's stoned to death. It's amazing the euphemism that is used at the end of the chapter, he fell asleep. I mean, that's just a Hebrew idiom for dying, but I don't know. I would think I would find a different way to describe being stoned to death as just falling asleep. But Stephen is so peaceful in the presence of Christ that he is described as falling asleep. Saul is there mentioned again, approving of the execution. So Stephen has died, and what's going to happen? A great persecution is going to come on the church in verse 1. All of a sudden, things in Jerusalem have become ten times hotter. The Jews are mobilized and motivated and enraged against Christians. It seems really bad at first. Christians are scattered from the safety and comfort of their homes, all except the apostles. And they go throughout Samaria and Judea, and they're scattered throughout. And, and don't look at Stephen's martyrdom with rosy-eyed perspective, because it says devout men make great lamentation there in chapter 8 and verse 2 over Stephen. So chapter 8 and verse one, you have great persecution. Chapter 8 and verse 2, you have great lamentation. They're mourning Stephen. They're burying Stephen. All of this evil has come against the church. This is all bad. Saul is emboldened by this. He's going from house to house, ravaging the houses, dragging off Christians, putting them in prison. Later in his life, Paul would say that he was a zealous persecutor of the church. A terrorist to Christians, if you will. All this is bad. Stephen's death is not fruitful. Stephen's death is a failure, right? Well, look in verse 4. Now those who were scattered, same word from chapter 8 and verse 1, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Literally, it says, those who were scattered went about evangelizing, proclaiming the good news of the resurrection of Jesus. So the Im image here is uh, Stephen dies, and then there's these ripple effects of persecution and lamentation, but Christians are scattered like seed. And as they're scattered like seed, the gospel is scattered like seed, and the kingdom advances. I don't think the followers of Jesus recognized that when Jesus said in Acts 1-8, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, I don't think they recognized how they were going to get there. Stephen's going to be stoned to death, great persecution's going to come on the church, and then you're going to be scattered out of the safety, comfort, convenience of your own homes, your normal lifestyle there in Jerusalem. But notice we don't have a, one word about how they complained or how they grumbled. But what did they do? They scattered and they spread the word of the gospel. They used this adversity as their opportunity to proclaim Christ. We read about Philip. Remember, he was one of the seven along with Stephen who was chosen to serve the widows in the church in Jerusalem. Philip goes down into Samaria and he preaches Christ to them, it says in verse 5. And as he preaches Christ, signs and wonders follow Philip, as signs and wonders followed Stephen. And demons are coming out of people, and crippled people are walking, and there's much joy in the city. There's much persecution in Jerusalem. There's much joy in Samaria because the gospel is being preached to these half-breeds. Remember, the Jews had no dealings with Samaritans, we're told in John chapter 4. Samaritans were seen as half-breeds. They were seen as not fully Jewish, not fully pure. They were a mixed race. 
And yet now the Christians are taking the gospel to a new pioneer mission zone. And people are being saved. Many are being saved in Samaria, especially under the evangelistic ministry of Philip and those who are spreading the gospel. And the kingdom is going on. What did Jesus say? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat dies, falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Stephen's laying down his life for the cause of Christ served to advance the missionary purposes of God. Yeah, Stephen looked like a failure from a worldly point of view. So did Telemachus. So did Jesus. But Christ advances his kingdom through the suffering and death of his followers. Now, as we've said, we may not be called to die as martyrs, but we are called to give ourselves away for the advance of the gospel. You could say Stephen, well, he was a preacher and he had signs and wonders. He's in a special class. But no, you can't say that about those who were scattered. Because in chapter 8 and verse 4, those who were scattered are not the apostles. They're ordinary Christian people. Kicked out of their homes, kicked out of their comfort, kicked out of their complacency. And what do they do? They go around telling people about Jesus. They give their lives away for the sake of the gospel. Because that's what Christians do. We deny ourselves. We take up our cross. And we follow Christ. Because we're motivated by His glory at the right hand of God, our intercessor. We're motivated by genuine love and concern for others who are lost. We genuinely want them to experience the pardoning grace of Jesus. And we're motivated by a mission that wherever we go, and whatever we do, we're called to say something about Jesus. And we're called to give our lives away to that end. You know, you might be a parent, you're called to give away your life for your children, right? You're pouring into them all the time. A grandparent, you might be a teacher, you might be a, just work as some other profession, but you're called to give yourself away for the kingdom, to die to yourself and give it away for Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the life and legacy of Stephen. We know that Stephen is no longer on this earth, but he's now in heaven with you. And we know that all of the saints who have died are the spirits of just men made perfect, and they are with you. And Lord, we know that we only have a short time on this earth, and you've called us to give ourselves away for the gospel. We pray that you would inspire us with the glory of Christ and fill us with the love of Christ and enable us to be committed to the mission of Christ, that we might be fruitful as Stephen was fruitful. Seal to our minds and hearts this day the truth of Jesus. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.